Jay Lally. Hi. Welcome, welcome to Throws Talk. Thank you for being here with us. So it's been an interesting year for you so far. It's certainly a breakthrough year. Yes. Um, some big throws uh, already under your belt, and that's very positive towards Rio 2016. So you've got to be happy with things so far. Of course. Um, yeah, it started uh, January, I think was my first competition, uh, in Newcastle, a sunnier version of our Newcastle. Um, the Australian one is, is warmer. Um, that was like a 58 meter throw and then had some, I think it was about five days after landing there and then we had a couple of weeks, uh, like three-ish weeks maybe, of training and then I knew training was going quite well and then my breakthrough moment in uh, uh, Auckland um, of 64-22 um, and then followed that up with a 65-10. So yeah, very good start to the year. Very surprising start really to the year. I didn't think uh, those kind of throws were going to come. but. And that came on a training camp down in Australia, so it's the second year you've been down there. Yeah. And and been able to work with uh, with Danny Samuels and her coach, uh, Dennis. Yeah, it's it's been really good. We, when we went last year, I say we, me, when I went last year, um, we were talking about sort of new, fairly new concepts, like technical points, and uh, it kind of threw me the first year, and I didn't really understand it, and it took me almost a year to kind of understand it and know what I was going to come back to. So obviously the weather's much better in Australia and the environment was brilliant. I had Dennis who's a pretty similar coach to Andy Neal, my coach, um, and have Danny there as a great inspiration and role model and training partner. So it made sense to go there. Uh, and then when I went back this year, I kind of knew what sort of technical points would probably be discussed. Um, and luckily, it was, it was, I was much quicker at trying to adapt to that, and it made some positive changes. Right. Let's go back a little bit, because let's give us a, a little bit of uh, understanding about your early years, because when did you get into the sport? How did you find yourself as a discus thrower? Way back when. Um, high jump, because I was tall. Um, kind at of got age? 15? 14, maybe? Mm -hmm. Maybe 14. Um, high jump was the first one, because I was tallest, and I kind of got shoved into that one, and I didn't do very well, and I didn't like it. Um, but my friend had taken up discus, um, this was like year 10-ish I guess, maybe maybe younger than that. Um, and uh, we joined our local athletics club which was Hercules Wimbledon in London. And she pointed out that she had thrown these plates and that, that was quite fun and I was like, don't know what you're talking about, no idea. Um, and she, when we went to uh, our track night and we went into the store cupboard, because we just wander around, uh, we found them and she said like, these are these plate things that we threw and I was like, no, nope, never seen them, don't know what that is. Um, and then we convinced one of the coaches to let's have a go and he got a little group of kids together and I beat everyone. <laughs> and I liked that one much better, I like to win so okay. it's, uh, I don't know if that's a good trait or a bad trait but that's how it started. And how long after that did you get to hook up with your coach Andy Neal because you've been with him for a long time? Yeah, many years, like half my life actually. Um, I guess, yeah, so 14-ish. I, I think it was around Maybe it was 16, maybe it was 15, I can't remember. It was like an under 17 year, so maybe 15, 16. So it wasn't that long after. I'd literally taken up sport, kind of had a go at everything. Uh, and then luckily, um, there was a guy that knew Andy at a competition that I went to. He asked who my coach was, and at the time I didn't have a, a set coach. You just kind of have a club coach. Um, and I said that I didn't have a, a throws coach as such. Uh, he said he knew someone in Horsham, which I'd never heard of, and it sounded like a million miles away. I told my dad, my dad, uh, did a little bit of research and knew where it was and then took me there and it's been going ever since, so yeah. And Andy, for those that don't know, is a man with a great deal of patience, which is <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what are you saying? I am a dream to work with. Okay. But yeah. it has been a long relationship and he's, he's worked very hard with you. He's been tested. <laughs> been tested. Yeah, so, fair to say that, yeah. yeah. He's a little guy with big patience. Okay, good. Good job. And also, one of the things that established you in the early days, when I first got to know about you, was you were a good competitor. So you usually performed up to expectations or beyond expectations, yes. which is always an important thing. So, yeah. and, and European Under-23 Championships, you came out of that with a medal, which was a surprise to most people. Yeah, yeah, me included. Um, that competition was my first uh, a major, I guess. Um, and I hadn't actually officially qualified because I hadn't hit the standards that UK had set. Um, but I performed, I think, decent throughout that year. And I was uh, competitive with Eden Francis at the time at our under 23 trials. Um, and I think I was winning that until the last round. And then Eden popped a bigger throw and won it. So 
Um, there was talk that there was like 50-50 chance of going and then luckily and very surprisingly it went in my favour. I, I was prepped because I'd never been to anything like that before on like what to expect from competitors and call rooms and how boisterous they can be and all of those kind of things. So I kind of like mentally prepped myself for, to do whatever. Um, and yeah, and, and I, I think I was in I think I was in a medal position most of the way through and then I got bumped down to four maybe, somewhere like that. And then on the last throw, I think it was the last throw, I, I yeah, raised my game I guess. And then I think, it was, I think it was PB of 54 or something. I think I was the only one to PB in that competition. Uh, and it was also my first drug test, so that was a whole world of experiences <laughs> on that meet. Um, and that took me like three hours, so okay. yeah. Um, and Andy was, I think he was a bit emotional. I could hear the tears on his phone, on my phone. So, so those, those age group championships are incredible for that kind of development. Yeah, sport, definitely. So. Uh, I mean, where, where else do you go from that? I mean, that's probably, that and the Commonwealth have been my only two experiences of anything mm. major. Unfortunately for me, I haven't been to a senior major, if mm. you're going to count Olympics and Worlds in that. They're the, I've, I've not been to any of that. Um, so yeah, I think they're, they're really important. Um, they're, they're important to qualify for, they're important to go to. If you're on the verge of qualifying, I would always opt the, any governing body to take that athlete because I think there's a lot of valuable experiences you can get from that. Yeah. And Commonwealth Games, you had great success in in, uh, in Glasgow, winning a medal there, although you were Yay. pipped for the silver medal right uh, towards the end of the competition. Yeah. But uh, also, uh, what was the, your experience like at the previous Commonwealth Games? I think you went to Delhi as well. Delhi, yeah. So, yeah, I did the under-23s in 2009 and then Delhi was in 2010. Um, and because I was, I was ranked really low in 2009 and then won a medal, I kind of had almost that expectation for Delhi, um, which kind of, I, I threw well. I think I threw 57, my PB at the time was 58. So, I mean, that was, that was decent. Mm. And I think from second to about eighth or seventh or something like that it was really close marks and I was in the mix of that and I think six I finished mm -hmm. um, and there was that was there was a lot of experience to take away from that it was the first senior and mm -hmm. um, although initially I was disappointed with where I'd finished on reflection I, I think I did actually quite well I think you were commentating that one yeah um, and uh, I think you you actually said that I was whatever from my my PB so yeah in hindsight that was a good experience the thing I took away mostly from that was the crowd and how much the crowd supported the Indian athletes and how much atmosphere there was and that's not something I'd ever 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 experienced and still to this day that's one of the most um, poignant moments I think I've probably had in my career just with how much support the crowd can give you. And did you get anything in Glasgow similar to that although you were an English athlete in yeah, Glasgow? Yeah, yeah. Very nationalistic, but they were very generous to, yeah, uh, absolutely. to all the British with, countries. Yeah, with all the home nations, they were all they were supporting everyone. Um, I think there was a bit of banter saying that maybe the Scots are going to boo the English and all those kind of things, but it wasn't like that at all. And um, and everyone was really supportive. It was mm. it was very much a British event rather than a Scottish event. I I is what I received from mm. that. Um, and I think yeah, it was amazing. Um, I don't, I don't know if it trumps the 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 Indian crowd to the Indian athletes in Delhi, maybe to, more to do with the actual structure of the, the stadium, but I think... And a clean, a clean sweep by the Indian. And yeah, yeah, so, that was, so I mean, that's phenomenal in itself, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know, it was weird to have that kind of support on, on your side, because that's that's the most I've done. I, obviously, I, I didn't go to London, but I, to experience the crowd on your side and not just another name in the crowd, uh, another name in the field is, is weird, and it, and it helps, it's yeah. good. Uh, and, and one of the things I, I remember about uh, about Glasgow is the fact that you came out and threw over 60 metres in the final, which is yeah. in itself an accomplishment and gives you a lot of confidence. So. Yeah, I'd but, had a bit of a difficult season that year. Um, I think I started off here again. Did I start off here? Maybe. Um, here in America and it was, it was a very slow start and actually that was the only time I got over 60 and I mean I was happy for it to be at any point in the season it was going to be in the Commonwealth yeah. final. Um, Again, I kind of I was a little bit lost through the whole season, and then kind of found my way just in the nick of time, really. Um, and yeah, I was I was happy. I knew roughly what would medal. Um, it's normally like a 59-ish, high 59 medal, and I think I'd thrown 59 in round two or something. So I knew I'd be close if not if I, if I didn't medal. Um, unfortunately, Seema nicked my silver, um, but I mean I was I'm happy to accept it. So I, that was probably one of the firmest bronze medal throws ever. In football, so yeah, I know. Thank you for
to you in here. Um, so yeah, but there, there's, I, I, I wouldn't change it for a while. It was, it was a good experience. And, and so, 2011 was when you first made a breakthrough in throwing 60 meters. I think mean, 2011 yes, yes. was you set the the 60-73 yes. uh, that year. 76. 76. Sorry. Yes. Um, but it took you quite a while to. Oh, many years. <laughs> it's been many years of struggle for you. Many years. But there's also been many illnesses and issues behind the scenes that most people didn't know about. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I. Yeah. That I guess was my breakthrough year in, in, in breaking 60 meters. 6076 in 2011. I thought it'd go on a steady linear upward curve um, or upward line, um, and unfortunately, uh, end of 2012, I uh, got I had found kidney stones, uh, and many of them, not just like a small one that I could painfully wee out. Um, it was a, an operation to remove those. A helicopter's coming back, just so you know. I know, uh, under shelter. Um, so yeah, so that was in 2012. Also, so that was kind of that obviously hindered stuff and, and progress and whatever and that was that was an operation in end of 2012 where I collapsed in training, that was interesting. Um, and then on a in a personal world of mine I then got divorced <laughs> into 2012 and that was finalised in 2013. Um, so that took that hit. Um, 2014 in Glasgow in the uh, qualifying rounds I felt weird but I didn't know what was weird and I said to Andy I was like something's not right I, I think you need to go get the doctor and he kind of patted me on the back and said oh you're just nervous off you go and I was like oh I don't I don't really feel nervous but oh, okay so I kind of like hobbled off I figured it was my lycra that was too tight or something I literally was set if you could get any footage I was sitting there on on a seat and just pulling open my trousers to try and get some sort of relief I thought I didn't know where it was coming from but something was uncomfortable around there um, and yeah, I just thought like my waist was being squeezed and um, luckily I qualified in the final and hit the automatic standard. Got back to the, uh, the village and uh, kind of, it didn't fully collapse but it was like really struggling and then the doctor come and found me and was like something's definitely wrong with you. I was like I don't know, I don't know what it is and we had to go to the pony clinic and that was in and out all night. And then I had a urine test there and then they said uh, you've got blood in your urine you need to get that sorted and I was like yeah definitely will do I've got the final tomorrow I'll do it after that and obviously I did well in the final completely forgot about my pains and illnesses and all those kind of things um, and then obviously media was um, kind of up and around at that point so I did all of that end of however many months that took I then I don't know how graphic you want me to be. <laughs> I'll go for it. Um, uh, went to the toilet and um, it was, it wasn't urine colour, it was very red. Uh, and I took a picture of it and sent that to the doctor and said, how normal is that? And then uh, I got a, a scan the next day, two days later. And then the guy who had operated on me two years before said, you've got a lot of kidney stones, we need to operate. So that was in like two days after that, I had another operation. Um, and those were pretty spectacular. I think one was five centimetres, it was partial staghorn, I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I was a very brave girl. But, um, but also the, the thing about kidney stones is for them to have come back that quickly, yeah, there must have been some underlying yeah, reason behind yeah. it. Yeah, so that's what the guy, the, the consultant said, he said that that's really, really unusual, that that's just shouldn't have come back like that and to the extent that they did. Um, then I had investigations, so that was literally like two years to the day, it was like November 2014 I had the operation. Um, and then after that we started going into investigations on why I've got these stones um, and then to cut a long story short I had uh, a benign tumour in my chest and to get through that you have to go through my neck um, so it was then trying to weigh up last year when to have that operation so that definitely needs to go uh, you can operate on immediately um, which will, also, it will have an effect on the season and I'm on I was on funding at the time and they're only on year contracts so, I mean if you have a big gap in the season and you don't perform well you get taken off and um, so there was that to consider but also I didn't want it to eat, in, eat into 2015 too much because I want to prep for this year I want to prep for the Olympic year and that's always been my main priority so it was trying to weigh up when the best time of that have, having that operation was um, and basically me and Andy it was it was a fairly easy decision in that Olympics come first um, and we had it in May, so I did a stint here, a stint in Australia, a stint in San Diego to try and get those qualifying stands for Beijing, for 61. I didn't manage it, I managed a high 59 I think, had the operation in May, came back for the British trials in June, July, whenever they were, 
won that, which was really happy. Two days after, through 60.01 in France, then thought, I've got 99 centimetres to go, I reckon I can do it. Unfortunately, didn't do it. Um, and then was taken off funding at the end of that year. Um, but I still think that was the right decision, and I, I was still able to put a really solid winter together from August to now um, of solid competition, solid training, all of that, and it's all it's all gone to plan. But I think one of the one of the, the let's say the one of the best things you did, you, you after you'd come off funding and you'd been removed from funding, you still made the decision of look, this is the most important year of my life. Yeah. I need to prepare for it in the in the right way. I've saved my money. I'm, you you work as well. Yes, yes. So you you share your time with your your work in order to make money to to pay for your training. Yeah. And made a very good plan of of this year. Yeah, I think it's important that although funding is is great whilst you're on it, it is worthwhile considering or knowing the fact that you're only on it for a year. And um, so if you pile everything into your funding for one year and then you come off. You're, you're going to be lost as soon as that finishes. And I was always aware of that. I was on it for four years, and every year I was trying to prepare myself. So if I come off, I'm not, I'm not screwed. Um, and luckily, I did the same last year. Um, I save as much as I can anyway. Um, I save through my work. I work to support myself, um, and everything that I wanted to do this year, I made sure I'd taken the right steps. So I was always going to go to Australia. I was always going to come here. Irrelevant if I was on funding or not, and depend on. I guess depending on what support you get financially or from whatever other companies that you can you can decide what kind of car you have or what kind of food you'll be eating but essentially the same structure will still stay in place you're still going to go there and you're still going to get this training and, and blah 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 and so now you've hit the stand you've hit the stand of four competitions already so it's a pretty good Yay. place to be um, but of course you still need to go through the rigmarole of, of the U of the UK championships yeah of course and, uh, and, and going through the selection process yeah I've not taken that for granted at all but what's your plan for the rest of the season then because now that you're in a good position you're not choosing to come out here to the US and try to throw far you've no. been doing competitions and throwing pretty well but yeah. this is much more of a training camp that you've done in previous previous years yeah it's um it's not like it's not a jolly it's, i'm not coming out here to have fun but i can take a much more relaxed approach to it than i have done in previous years because i have the standards already um and the only the only thing i need to do is to finish top two at the trials and then my automatic selection is, is done and dusted no one can say anything um so it's still coming out here, it's still getting away from work, it's still being able to be a full-time athlete for five weeks um, and see what I can produce here. Um, Competition-wise for the rest of the season, luckily now I'm able to get into some Diamond League, so I'm not trying to chase standards with competition that isn't quite where I want it to be. Um, so now I get to be, hopefully with the best in the world, going around the world and, and competing from there. So I really want to, I want to start getting used to throwing I think 62 plus will make the final, high 62s, um, if I can throw that as often as I can I think that will be um, a good step and I think uh, a good mental step in the, in the right direction at least um, to making that Olympic final. Um, so if I can do that frequently in good competition I think that, that gives me confidence and it's, there's a clear line of ability that I, I can do that. And of course now you get the chance to compete on the Diamond League, you get a chance to compete against the best girls exactly, on yeah. a regular basis, yeah. so you're not scared or No, yeah, I them. mean, I don't know how different it is going to Olympics, I've never been to one, um, and I don't know what the world's are like because I've never been to one, so there's lots of things that I could scare myself with, with all these lists of things that I haven't done, but it's still just going into a cage and throwing mm -hmm. a discus the same as I would yeah. do in Horsham, the same as I would do in the Olympic finals. Exactly. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, but to be amongst those, that, that calibre of people mm -hmm. is not something I'm massively used to, mm -hmm. and I'll maybe get a couple of them every now and then, but to, to have that Diamond League set up is going to help me quite a lot, I think. And also, unfortunately, with the Diamond League change of rules and you only get three throws and then the top four get another three or something. Um, those three throws, I'm going to have to use that in my in my sure. um, preparation. Yeah, yeah, in my preparation because you're only going to get three in the qualifying. Um, so it's going to be important that I go to a diamond league with the best in the world and do well in those yeah. first three throws. So I'm going to have to use that as a positive. And, and the best piece of advice I ever got from one of my old coaches, Brooks Johnson, is that he used to tell me in championships, "What got you there will keep you there." So okay. you know, when you are a 
you go out to competitions, you're throwing 62 meters, and that's what qualifies you for the championships. You go and repeat that in the championships, yeah. it's going to keep you in the mix. Yes. And and some people forget that. Yes. And they go out there thinking, oh, I've got to throw beyond my capabilities. Yeah. When in fact, all you need to do, you've earned the right to be there, you just need to perform at the same level yeah. consistently. Yeah. And you have great consistency so far this year. And yeah. So that's important to carry that through. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the plan too. I don't, I don't intend on trying to break records mm. or trying to outdo myself. I just need to keep doing what right. I've been doing. That's good. You and Andy have had the, the, the opportunity to, to um, take some knowledge away from Dennis Knowles and, and, and yeah. Danny and stuff. And, and you have made some technical changes over this last year as well. Yeah. Um, so what are what have they we've, we've heard about the illnesses and and the yeah. fitness improvements because of that yeah um, what about the technical changes what have you taken on board that you think have made a difference now um it came from mac wilkins here um dennis and danny spoke to him i guess a few years back uh, and they would i assume they changed quite a lot about their entry into mm -hmm. the circle and and Although Andy has been trying to get me to do the similar things um, with this wide uh, right sweeping leg on entry and, and trying to get their hip to go down across the circle. Um, sometimes, even though you're telling someone or asking someone or describing someone to the same thing, just hearing it from someone else or in, in a different wording or just like the sentence just to be restructured a little bit makes so much more sense. Um, and it's not that Andy didn't know what he was talking about, he does, but it, I just, for some reason, like, it, it wasn't clicking as well um, as it did in Australia. So I think that was the break, breakthrough, and also having been there the year before, it wasn't a completely new concept, it was something that I, it baffled me first time out, and I was like, I don't get it, but it is something that I'm vaguely familiar with, the idea of this wide sweeping leg, um, rather than just being this kind of quick, short movement. Um, but having that year and talking to Andrew through that last year um, and then having that, that, that whole of 2015 to kind of go through things and, and, and looking at balance stuff with things that are not directly related to discus like Pilates and those kind of things, like my Pilates instructor has been really influential, unfortunately for me, but has actually paid off so fortunately now for me. Um, but just looking at balances and those kind of things and then having Andy out in, in this year in Sydney and having him talk to Dennis rather than my translation of what Dennis is, do is doing to me or talking to me about and then translating that over. Um, it just Everything just kind of made more sense and it was kind of layer upon layer rather than new concept, here you go, have a go. So I think everything was just a bit more reinforced and those technical changes have stuck so yeah. far. And Andy's been with you here in California and yes. got a chance also to speak firsthand to Mac about those yeah, same yeah. ideas. Yeah, so. so they had the, a, a, a private conversation of um, whatever they were talking about, I guess coaching points. I'm easily confused. I know it's hard to believe, um, but it's not something that I can be part of because it will confuse me. It will slow me down. It will make me mechanical. It make me much worse, I'm sure. So Andy chose to have that conversation. Um, he had it with Dennis in January, and he's had it now with Mac in April. Um, so he kind of understands what they're talking about. He obviously has his ideas of, of what will make me a better thrower. Um, and yeah, and I guess it's just a merge of those two or three people um, and then putting that together with me and seeing what I'm able to or not able to do. Well, one of the big breakthroughs that you made this year that you became the English record holder. Yeah. That had been uh, something you wanted to do for a while. For five years I've been after that. And, and that was was a, a seemingly potentially uh, reachable for the last five years for you. Yeah. It wasn't that, that far a distance. But no. there was a British record by Meg Ritchie, who, mm. which was set... Uh, some 20, 30 years ago, yeah, um, and that's still on the table. But now you're in the touching distance. Almost of that. in the mix there. Yeah, it's not it, honestly. It's not something. Five months ago, it's not something we'd ever considered. We didn't actually think we would ever go. Um, I didn't think I was capable of 65. Um, I knew I was capable of 61.22, which is the previous English PB uh, record holder, record. Um, the British record 67.48. Um, it's, I think, I don't know, I don't know if I can get that. I, I think I can get that. I don't know if and when it will come. Um, I think just to be consistent with movement and then put good conditions on top of that, I think it would go. Um, it's not something I'm chasing at the moment. It, if it comes, it comes. Um, 
this year is definitely all about Olympics. Next year, I'd like to go to the Olympic Stadium um, with a full crowd. So, yeah. and that will be for the world. Yeah. So uh, that would be amazing to go to, um, and not quite a, a making up for the Olympics, but the for the London Olympics. But it's it's definitely a, a good something that's been on my calendar and something that's been on my radar. So um, those are my priorities. Records are there to be broken. Um, the championships. Is, I'm more about the championships. Um, if the record goes, it would be great, and I'd like it to go to me, obviously. <laughs> but um, we'll see. It's not something I'm chasing at the moment. Jay, thank you very much, and good luck for the season. Thanks very much.